This work aims to build computational models that take sound as input and predict what humans hear. For such a model to address hearing loss, it would ideally predict hearing behavior in both real-world conditions and in psychoacoustic or audiological texts. Recently, machine learning models have been shown to replicate many aspects of auditory perception. These models often consist of a hardwired auditory nerve model front end, which feeds into a deep neural network whose weights are optimized for an ecological hearing task. The underlying idea is that human hearing has been optimized over evolution and development to solve important tasks. Machine systems, if optimized under similar constraints, might arrive at similar solutions. And this approach has yielded good models of human word recognition, pitch perception, sound localization, and voice recognition. In this work, though, we want to know if these models can help us understand hearing loss. Can they help us answer what are the perceptual consequences of different types of hearing loss in the periphery, both in real-world listening conditions and in psychoacoustic or audiological tests? Model predictions under different peripheral hearing loss configurations may offer insight into the diversity of individual outcomes in hearing loss. Unlike prior models that separately tackled these domains, here we trained a single model to both localize and recognize sounds using simulated auditory nerve representations. The training dataset consists of millions of naturalistic auditory scenes rendered in different virtual acoustic environments. Each scene consisted of a target speech sound at one location and diffusely localized non-speech noise. The weights of the neural network were jointly optimized for four classification tasks and to operationalize different aspects of natural hearing, sound localization, word recognition, voice recognition, and environmental sound recognition. The schematic above illustrates how the network weights are shared across the four tasks in the first six layers, and only the last couple layers are task specific. So we can train a model to do all this no problem. Then we want to know, does the trained model hear like a human? To compare them, we run human participants and our model on the same behavioral experiments. We measured effects of noise on speech recognition using our middle word recognition task. We play participants two second speech excerpts in many different noise conditions, and the task is report which word of 800 options occurred in the middle of the excerpt. Here's how well humans perform the task. This figure plots word recognition accuracy as a function of 43 different types of real world noise. We use different auditory textures that people naturally encounter. Even though all noise conditions were presented at the same SNR, they produce a pretty wide range of performance, with some conditions being much harder for people than others. Now here's how well our model does when tested on the same stimuli and task. It performs very similarly, accounting for about 97% of the explainable variance in human performance. Conditions that are harder for people are also harder for our model. And importantly, the model was never fit to the human data in any way. The similarity to humans simply emerges in a model optimized solely for performance on its ecological training task. So that's our model's speech recognition and noise. What's nice in our current multitask model is that we can also look at spatial speech perception. For instance, we can measure the combined effects of reverberation and spatial separation on speech recognition. We simulate an experiment from Butelman and Brand that measured speech perception thresholds in both reverberant and anechoic conditions as a function of the separation between speech and noise. The speech location was fixed straight ahead at zero degrees and they varied the noise location. And the, the thing to take away is that speech reception thresholds get better when the noise is more off to the side, spatially separated from the speech. This spatial release from masking is much larger in anechoic than in reverberant conditions. We measured our model speech reception thresholds in analogous conditions and here's what the results look like. We don't expect a perfect match since the stimuli are not identical, but qualitatively, the model accounts for these effects. It exhibits spatial release for masking, and the effect is larger in anechoic conditions than reverberant conditions. So we have this model that replicates some aspects of naturalistic hearing behavior. But can we take it into the lab and measure its audiogram or other psychoacoustic thresholds? Here's one way. We can play the model many examples of silence and collect all the activations from the intermediate model stages. I'm plotting them here as points in 2D space, but in reality, these internal representations are very high dimensional. We can collect the same activations in response to pure tones of different frequencies and levels. And then by training a simple linear classifier to discriminate model activations between pure tones and silence, it's possible to measure the model's pure tone detection thresholds or the model's audiogram. 
Of course, the audiogram is only the simplest example. The same exact approach can simulate many psychoacoustic experiments. For instance, we trained another linear classifier to discriminate activations from amplitude modulated and unmodulated stimuli to measure modulation detection thresholds. Human thresholds for detecting small amplitude modulations have been extensively measured, and they're highly sensitive to different stimulus parameters. And while I must skip the details of these classic experiments today, we measured the same thresholds from our model and found that they quite nicely resemble those of humans. Again, this model is not fit to the human data in any way. The similarity suggests that human-like processing of amplitude modulation simply emerges in a model optimized for ecological hearing tasks. So now we've seen that the model replicates some aspects of both naturalistic and psychoacoustic behavior in normal hearing. To model hearing loss, we'll take a look at our network's ears. We use a very simple model of the auditory periphery, consists of a gamma-tone filter bank, followed by rectification and low-pass filtering, and sigmoid rate level functions to map outputs to auditory nerve firing rates, in which we sample spike trains, modeling 32,000 spiking auditory nerve fibers per ear. Though it's a fairly crude model of the auditory nerve, we can still simulate some of the well-known peripheral effects of hearing loss by essentially turning three knobs. The first broadens the frequency tuning of the cochlea. The second turns down the cochlear amplification, reducing responses to quiet sounds. So together, these first two knobs effectively represent the health of outer hair cells. And the third knob controls the number of auditory nerve fibers. We simulate synaptopathy by reducing the number of spike trains in the peripheral representation. We first set these knobs to produce plausible hearing loss configurations. So starting with the normal hearing model, we turned them proportionally in a frequency-dependent manner to produce audiograms representative of mild, moderate, and severe hearing loss. And then the question is, what are the perceptual consequences of this manipulation? Like in humans, we find that hearing loss progressively impairs the model's speech recognition performance, particularly in noise. It also progressively reduces spatial release from masking. The model also replicates aspects of hearing-impaired psychoacoustic behavior. Hearing loss progressively increases the model's temporal gap detection thresholds and the extent of spectral masking. These are two perceptual measures thought to quantify temporal and spectral resolution in the periphery. To probe what peripheral distortions drive these perceptual effects, we also tested the model with idealized hearing loss configurations by independently turning each of these knobs, creating sets of models with only broadened frequency tuning, or only reduced cochlear amplification, or only auditory nerve fiber loss. We then ran those idealized hearing loss models on all the same experiments, and here are the results. It's a bit much to look at, so I'll highlight just a couple points. First, we see that all three types of distortions can contribute to poorer speech recognition and noise. Similarly, all distortions can potentially reduce spatial release from masking. Psychoacoustics, however, show more distinct perceptual effects. As we'd expect, changes in the audiogram are primarily driven by loss of cochlear amplification. Frequency tuning and nerve fiber loss have little effect there. Temporal gap detection is quite selectively sensitive to nerve fiber loss, and spectral masking is most sensitive to changes in cochlear frequency tuning. To wrap up now, I've shown you that a model jointly optimized for localization and recognition tasks replicates aspects of human binaural speech perception. So that human-like psychoacoustic behavior emerges from optimization for ecological tasks. And lastly, we saw that different peripheral distortions can produce distinct perceptual outcomes in the model. There are a couple of important caveats to be aware of. First, the results I've shown today are all based on a relatively simple model of the cochlea. And second, they also neglect a possible role of plasticity. Our model does not adapt to its changed ears after hearing loss. Nonetheless, our model captured important aspects of hearing and could enable exciting future directions like using it to design diagnostics or compensation strategies for hearing loss. With that, I'd like to thank my collaborators and the funding sources.